So it's my pleasure to be with you guys uh, this morning. Um, the circumstances were not the greatest. Um, I know that Terry has started a Revelation series, and he called me yes or texted me yesterday. He's been fighting a pretty nasty bug this week, and he asked me if I would speak this morning. And if you know Terry well, I mean, the man has preached with a cast on his foot. He's preached when he could hardly breathe. He's had just illnesses have hit him before, and nothing's kept him from speaking. So he's, he's not feeling good for him to ask if I would come and do this today. So please keep him up in your prayers um, and just pray that, you know, that God heals him 100% quickly and everything so he can get back on his feet doing what he loves to do so much. Um, but since he's not here, at first he asked me if I would uh, continue the Revelation series. I was like, all right, so he sent me his manuscript, and then he said, as a matter of fact, I've spent a lot of time studying this, and you've only got like four hours now, so no, we're not going to do that. Um, he, said, oh, he said I could speak on anything I wanted, and I was like, yes! <laughs> so will you please open your phones to the ESPN app and pull up the 49ers highlights? <laughs> God was with them, and we're going to talk about it. And <laughs> Just kidding, obviously, but God was with them. It was good. So I thought I'd share with you guys today about a journey with Jesus, and brand new year, new decade, 2020. How many of you guys have made New Year's resolutions? More than first service, all right. Still not much, but more than first. How many of you guys didn't put up your hands because you're too nervous to admit it, but you already broke your New Year's resolutions? There's some more hands, there we go, all right. So at the end of a year, that's you know, something typically a lot of us do, right? We, we set goals, we say, this year I will do this, this next year I'm going to do this. Sometimes you get through it, sometimes you don't. I know at the end of 2018, we had a service here at Creekside where people wrote notes and letters to themselves. And some of you may have gotten them in the mail this year, right before New Year's Eve. And I know that I got mine, and I opened it up, and I was like, you know, I had like five or six things. I was like, yeah, nailed it, nailed it. Let's not talk about the rest of these. You know, I just kind of didn't quite get those. But um, we do that with New Year's things. We have, we have goals we set. Sometimes we hit them, sometimes we don't. But I know that this year, I set some pretty big, significant goals for myself, some, some health goals, some professional goals, some goals for my family, and, you know, 12 days in, I'm still doing good, you know, so you know, doing, last year, I can honestly say, looking at one of mine, I blew it on day two, but 12 days in this year, I'm doing so good on mine, but sometimes we can get so fixated on the question of where we want to go. We set our goals, and that's what we want to go. We forget a big part of the equation. What do I need to do to get there? Sometimes it's easy to look far off and say, that's what I want, and that's not bad, but we can often forget to look a little bit closer and see what we're going to do to help get ourselves to that point. How do we get from here to there? And that's a question that we're going to go over today, but I think there's even a bigger question to ask before that one. If you want to talk about going from here to there, and that's going to be a big point of today, it's not going to really matter where you're going if you don't know where you're starting from. Everyone has a different starting point where they are. And we live in the wonderful world now of GPS. Um, some of us may remember the MapQuest days. You get in the car, you have the driver and the irreplaceable navigator. That person is reading those lines and the driver is watching the odometer miles tick because they go, in 0.3 miles, you're going to turn. And if you missed that turn, you couldn't U-turn your paper directions. That was just, now you were done. And it was, it was you know, stressful. But directions that always say, the one that always confused me was, start out by going west on this street. It's like, I don't know. Can't you say, look at my house and turn left? You know, that would, that would be the easier thing to do. But now we have GPS, you know, and we have laid out directions. But if you don't know where you're starting from, directions are going to take you somewhere else every time. Someone else's directions will take you somewhere else that you didn't necessarily maybe want to go. For example, if I were to tell someone, you know, say, how do you get to Creekside? I would say, okay, well, just like I said, I leave my driveway and I turn right go all the way down the street until I can't turn anymore, make another right, go under the overpass, up on the freeway, get off on Morello, make a right, I pass this massive tree in the middle of the street, then I turn right again, and the church is on my right. If you can't follow those directions and you miss the church, you shouldn't be driving. <laughs> but if I told anyone, if they said how to get to Creekside, and I gave them that set of directions, who knows where they'd end up? Certainly wouldn't be here, because their here is different than my here. So when we set goals and we look at where we want to go in our, in our personal walk or our walk with God, I think it's really important to establish where are we now? Where are you now? Because that's going to change the directions you take and the way that you're going to go. <clears throat> you would be somewhere else, not here. Because directions are not just about the destination. 
they are about the starting point. Where are you starting? And as we speak this morning from here to there, it's going to be about a journey with God. And we're going to look through some scripture and we're going to see some awesome stories about how Jesus meets people in some amazing places and he defines their here. But what's great is we'll see that they never just stay here. He always takes them there. And it's really, really cool. We're going to read a lot of scripture today. Because what I want to do is I want to read the whole story so you kind of get a context of what's going on and not just certain key points. So we're going to read a lot. And I'm going to read all four of these passages together. And then we'll start unpacking them and see how Jesus interacted with each person. Sound good? good. All right. So if you have your Bibles, turn to John chapter 4. We are going to start in verse 6. Some of you may be familiar with the story. This is the woman at the well, where Jesus talks with a Samaritan woman at the well. So starting in verse 6, we're going to read all the way through to verse 30. So it's a big chunk, but, but stick with me. There's, there's a lot of good stuff in here. So here we go. Uh, Jacob's well was there, and Jesus, tired as he was from his journey, sat down by the well. It was about the sixth hour. When a Samaritan woman came to draw water, Jesus said to her, Will you give me a drink? His disciples had gone into the town to buy food. The Samaritan woman said to him, You are a Jew and I am a Samaritan woman. How can you ask me for a drink? For the Jews do not associate with Samaritans. Jesus answered her, If you knew the gift of God and who it is that asks you for a drink, you would have asked him and he would have given you living water. Sir, the woman said, You have nothing to draw with and the well is deep. Where can you get this living water? Are you greater than our father Jacob who gave us the well and drank it himself? as did also his sons and flocks and herds. Jesus answered, everyone who drinks this water will be thirsty again, but whoever drinks the water I give him will never thirst. Indeed, the water I give him will become in him a spring of water welling up to eternal life. The woman said to him, sir, give me this water so that I won't keep getting thirsty and have to keep coming here to draw water. He told her, go call your husband and come back. I have no husband, she replied. It's about to get real. Jesus said to her, You are right when you say that you have no husband. The fact is, you have had five husbands, and the man you have now is not your husband. What you have just said is quite true. Sir, the woman said, I can see that you are a prophet. Our fathers worshipped on this mountain, but you Jews claim that the place where we must worship is in Jerusalem. Jesus declared, Believe me, woman, a time is coming when you will worship the Father neither on this mountain nor in Jerusalem. You Samaritans worship what you do not know. We worship what we do know, for salvation is from the Jews. Yet a time is coming and has now come when the true worshipers will worship the Father in spirit and truth, for they are the kind of worshipers the Father seeks. God is spirit, and his worshipers worship in spirit and in truth. The woman said, I know the Messiah called Christ is coming. When he comes, he will explain everything to us. Then Jesus declares, I who speak to you am he. Just then his disciples returned and were surprised to find him talking with a woman. But no one asked, what do you want or why are you talking to her? Then, leaving her water jar, the woman went back into town and said to the people, Come see a man who told me everything I ever did. Could this be the Christ? They came out of town and made their way toward him. So that's the end of passage number one. Passage number two, and we're going to unpack these all together in a little bit. Passage two, we're going to go to Luke chapter 24. So back to Luke 24. Now, a little bit about this passage. context about what we're about to read. We have a couple of men walking on a road to Emmaus. These were disciples, not disciples of the original 12, but Jesus had been crucified. They were told his body was gone, and now they are on a road out of Jerusalem. So starting in verse 13, chapter 24, verse 13, we're going to see how Jesus meets these guys. Now that same day, two of them were going to a village called Emmaus, about seven miles from Jerusalem. They were talking with each other about everything that had happened. And as they talked and discussed these things with each other, Jesus himself came up and walked along with them, but they were kept from recognizing him. He asked them, what are you discussing as you walk along? They stood still, their faces downcast. One of them named Cleopas said to him, are you only a visitor to Jerusalem and do not know the things that have happened there in these days? What things, he asked. About Jesus of Nazareth, they replied. He was a prophet, powerful in word and deed before God and in all the people. The chief priests and our rulers handed him over to be sentenced to death, and they crucified him. But we had hoped he was going to be the one to redeem Israel. And what is more, it is the third day since all this took place. In addition, some of our women amazed us. They went to the tomb early this morning, but didn't find his body. 
they came and told us they had seen a vision of angels who said he was alive. Then some of our companions went to the tomb and found it, just as the women had said, but him they did not see. He said to them, how foolish you are and how slow of heart to believe all that the prophets have spoken. Did you not, did not the Christ have to suffer these things and then enter his glory? And beginning with Moses and all the prophets, he explained to them what was said in all the scriptures concerning himself. As they approached the village to which they were going, Jesus acted as if he was going further. But they urged him strongly, stay with us, for it is nearly evening and day is almost over. So he went to stay with them. This is where it gets real for these guys. When he was at the table with them, he broke bread and gave thanks. Well, he took bread, gave thanks, broke it, and began to give it to them. Then their eyes were opened and they recognized him, and he disappeared from their sight. Then they asked each other, were not our hearts burning within us while he talked with us on the road and opened the scriptures to us? They got up and returned at once to Jerusalem. There they found the eleven and those with them assembled together and saying, it is true, the Lord is risen and appeared to Simon. Then the two told what happened on the way and how Jesus was recognized by them when he broke the bread. The next passage is John chapter 21. And due, due to time, I'm actually going to abbreviate this one. But John, this is again, Jesus has been crucified, resurrected, and he has appeared to many people. John has decided he doesn't want to talk to Jesus right now. And he is back on his boat fishing. John, before Jesus found him, was a fisherman. So John has returned to what he was doing. And when he's on the boat fishing, they fish all night. They don't catch anything. And a man comes to the shore and tells them to cast their nets on the other side. They cast their nets over. This is not the first time Jesus has done this with these guys. The nets are too big to pull in the fish. <clears throat> it says here, uh, Jesus is talking to Peter. I'm sorry. Peter goes, and when he's out there fishing, he casts the nets. The fish come. Peter recognizes this as Jesus. He jumps off of the boat to go back to Jesus. He recognizes who is there, what he's done, how he, Peter has been hiding, and he jumps back in to go see Jesus. Jesus has a conversation with them over dinner as they're eating a lot of these fish they just caught. He asks them three times, says, Simon Peter, do you love me? Simon Peter all three times says, yes, I love you. And Jesus tells him to watch my sheep. The last one is Matthew 9, 9. This one is really short but there's a lot in it. Matthew 9, 9 says this. As Jesus went on from there, he saw a man named Matthew sitting at the tax collector's booth. Follow me, he told him, and Matthew got up and followed him. Short and sweet, but there's a lot right there that we're going to get to. Now, I love these stories. These stories are incredible, beautiful stories about people that have a very powerful encounter with Jesus that changes their lives. And I would love to hear their side of the story, how things played out. Like, imagine yourself, the, the woman at the well. Now, a little bit about her. Samaritans were people that the Jews did not associate with. But it says that this woman went to the well at the sixth hour. That was after everybody else was already at the well. So she was an outcast hiding herself from her own people. She didn't want to be seen with everybody else. She was ashamed of her life, and she was going where no one else would be there. But lo and behold, Jesus is there. And, and Jesus, it's almost like he's a little harsh at first, right? He's there talking. He's like, get me water. Oh, you don't have anything. Go get your husband. Oh, you're not married, are you? <laughs> it's, he he kind of drops this truth bomb on her and, uh, and totally confronts her on what she's doing. He says, you've had five husbands, and the man you're with now is not even your husband. I mean, if Jesus had a mic at that moment, that would have been a drop the mic moment for her, right? I don't have husband. You're right, you don't. This is what you do have. Boom! <laughs> but... She's still curious, and she, she asks him about what's going on, and, and through their conversation, you see, for the, he reveals himself to her, but for this woman, and it can be true for some of us too, the gospel is bad news before it becomes good news. And what I mean is, no one really likes to be called out on their sin, right? If you're doing something wrong, and you know it's wrong, and someone says, hey, you shouldn't do this, it's not a, I know, thank you for telling me. You know, it's, that's normally not the reaction you have when you're called out on something. So, so when, when Jesus comes and says, this is what you're doing, it's typically not a hooray moment. It, it's the bad news. It's the, you're right, I, I'm messing up. But what's great is once you recognize that news, you then get to taste the sweet taste of Jesus' mercy and forgiveness. And that's what Jesus gets to explain to this woman at the well. <clears throat> she wasn't even out looking for him, and she got to experience him. He found her at a well hiding in fear from her sin, hiding from others in town, she was seeking peace. 
away, but Jesus finds her. And I love it, because when he finds her where she is, he's establishing her here. He establishes that. He says, this is what's going on in your life. This is where you are. He confronts her. He challenges her. And then he offers her the greatest gift ever, the living water that only he can give. And I love it that ultimately she chooses to accept it, but she has to reconcile her here, right then, right there. And through that, I love her reaction. She leaves a changed woman. She doesn't just leave and say, you know what? I don't like what you just said to me. Get your own water and walk away. She acknowledges, you know all these things, and he says that he's the Messiah. And what does she do? She goes from being that woman that's hiding from people to the woman that's running to the people, saying, come meet this man. This is the guy. This is the Messiah. He just revealed who I am to me. She's not hiding anymore. Jesus did an amazing thing with her, meeting her where she was, taking her to the place where he knew she needed to go. For the disciples that were on the road to Emmaus, now he found, out, found them on a path leaving Jerusalem. Now some more context for these guys. Again, Jesus was dead. Or he had been resurrected. They were in the room. We can know that from the passage. They said, we were in the room. Some women came. They said that Jesus, they, he was, the tomb was open. The body's gone. They came back. We left. They were scared. And in this time, you can see that the Romans, obviously, they had just crucified Jesus. The Romans and Pharisees and everyone involved in that had him crucified. They were scared the Romans were going to be coming after them. So they were scared of this moment. They had questions about who Jesus said he was, which they actually said to Jesus in the passage. And they decided instead of sticking around, they were checking out. They were on the road seven miles outside of Jerusalem, walking away. They were having a huge struggle with their faith. They had heard what Jesus said. They were there with him. They said, we'd seen him do many miracles, but it's been three days and we don't know where he is. They had a big struggle and they decided that they were going to walk away and try and save themselves from fear instead of sticking it through. Now, <clears throat> I love the fact that Jesus comes on the road with them and he doesn't reveal himself at first because he gets them to start explaining to themselves even, where is there here? It's like, where are you guys going? And they start explaining, this is what's going on. This is where we're at. And through their conversation, then Jesus reveals to himself who he is. And I love their reaction. Jesus, when he reveals who he is and they get to see he is the Messiah, he is back, they go the 180. It's the, we're leaving Jerusalem, we're going back, and they start telling everybody that they saw Jesus. He helped them establish they're here, and they knew that they had to go there. There, there was back to Jerusalem. Try saying that five times fast. There, 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 there was back to Jerusalem. But he established that with them. And he identified where they needed, they identified where they needed to go because of their walk with Jesus. These guys had a lot of answers in their heads, but in their hearts, they didn't believe. And that's when Jesus helped them identify what was in their head. He helped move it to their heart. And then they were able to go continue to tell people that Jesus was alive. Then you've got Peter on the boat after the crucifixion. Jesus has already been resurrected. Peter's seen the empty tomb. He's freaking out. Hundreds of people have seen Jesus at this point. This is probably about a week later. And where does Peter go? Back to fishing. This is where Jesus found Peter in the first place, fishing. Peter went back to what he was known to do. And I think <clears throat> Peter was really haunted from the last interaction he had with Jesus. If you are unfamiliar with it, Peter had just recently denied Jesus three times. They were eating the, what we call the, the scriptures call the Last Supper together. Jesus said, someone's going to betray me. Peter said, nope, I'd never do that. And Jesus called him out and said, hey, before the night's over, you're going to, three times you're going to deny me. Peter said, nope, won't do it. I would die for you. I'll never do it. It happened. So that's the last interaction Peter has with Jesus. So I can imagine when people are now saying, Jesus is back. I saw Jesus. He's like, I'm going this way. And he gets back on his boat to go fishing. He, he's probably just haunted and afraid of this conversation that may happen later. So he went back to what he was doing before. But despite how much of a failure that he feels, and despite of how much of a failure that maybe he was in that moment, Jesus met him here. Jesus went to the shore, went to the boat. And when Peter saw him and saw that it was Jesus coming to him, he abandoned everything again. It's like, forget the boat, I'm going to you. And he jumped in the water and went to Jesus. I love that reaction. When, you, when he felt that, you know what, despite my failures, Jesus didn't reject me. He still came to me. I get to dive to him. Jesus came to Peter while he was wallowing in sadness, feeling like a failure with no use in God's plan. And Jesus still met him there. He asked Peter point blank, 
do you love me? To which Peter says, yes, three times. And Jesus says, feed my sheep. He's restoring Peter and telling him where he needs to go. And finally, Matthew. Like I said, this was the shortest one in all the scriptures we read. But there's so much packed in here. So Matthew, his real name was Levi. And we find that in different uh, gospels when they talk about the tax collector Levi. This is the same guy. But Levi was a name that was not just given to anybody. Levi was a name that if a parent gave that to their child, they wanted their child to grow up to be a Levitical priest in the time, a master of the law, a master of the scriptures. They were going to be in priesthood, and they were going to be experts. If you had that name Levi, that's who you were. And so did anybody here, you know, if you grew up going to church and you grew up going to Sunday school, you, know, you, you get the children's ministry lessons. Or imagine, so imagine doing that every day. Not just Sundays, that's what you do every day. And then at night, you go to a, another program, or there's a thing called Awana that I know a lot of kids really like to go to, where it's another uh, church-based uh, like school studies type thing. And imagine doing that in the day, and then Awana at night, and that's just what you do. If you did that for years starting now, you would not even come close to what a Levitical priest knew, because they did that from birth. Their name was Le- your name was Levi, you had your job career set lined out for you. But where does Jesus find him? A tax collector. If you don't know much about tax collectors, I know we don't like them now to this day, but, but and then it was even worse back in Bible times. You see, tax collectors were Jewish people working for the Romans. And to give you some context on just how brutal that is, let's imagine today, let's say United States gets invaded by another nation, the other nation takes over. If they were to treat us today the way the Romans treated the Jews back then, to give you some context, they would come in, they would take a third of the Christians immediately executed. They would take another third, and they would have you crucified along the roads just to establish their fear and their power and authority over you. And then the remaining third now have to live under that rule and that fear of what could be should they not follow. So now imagine you're one of the third left. You (laughs) you survived the two-thirds cut. But one of your friends says, you know what? I'm going to save my own skin. I'm going to go work for these guys, and that's going to mean I'm going to be robbing you so I can survive myself. You probably won't be too close with that person anymore. Because now they're joining the people who just wiped out everybody else. Tax collectors. Everybody get it now a little bit? When the Jewish people saw a tax collector, they were scum. Do not associate with them. They are our own people working for the enemy. And this is where Jesus finds Matthew. I love it. Matthew is at his tax collector's booth. He is in the place where he is hated by everyone that he sees. And Jesus goes there to see him. And when Jesus sees him, he says, hey, follow me. Can you imagine the acceptance Matthew felt in that moment? To know that everywhere he goes, he's rejected, he's rejected, he's rejected, but people still have to do what he says because he would steal and he could lie and he could say things that could have them arrested or killed. But finally someone comes to him and says, follow me. This is a big thing for Matthew. He's sitting at his table that literally represents that he's given up on himself. He's given up on the life that was intended for him because his name was Levi. He's passed it on. He'd rather please himself than please God. And God still meets him there. I love it. Jesus says, follow me. I think that through all all of these stories, there are some principles that we get to apply to us about our here and how we get to go there and how God works in each and every one of us. And firstly, what I love in these is that I learned that, that we don't find God, God finds us. God finds you no matter where you are. And it's often at a time and a place that's really not going to fit your schedule. You can't really write in, oh yeah, doing this, doing this, meeting with God on this time will change everything here and then go back to the rest of your life. You know, it's just you don't get to plan these things a lot. But when God found me, it was at a very inconvenient time in my life, not how I mapped it out. Now, um, a lot of you may know my story. I grew up in church, this church specifically. Uh, My grandpa was the pastor here before Pastor Terry, and I was here every Sunday, every Wednesday night. This is, this was, this church was a second home to me. And if you were to ask me questions about the Bible and Bible stories, I could tell you the answers. I knew the stories, knew the scriptures, you know, the first person to turn the book in the Bible there, boom, got it. Like, I was, I was there. I had a whole lot of head knowledge. And, and on top of that, I knew that when I grew up, I wanted to be a baseball player. I loved baseball. 
through elementary school, middle school, and even in high school, I was playing baseball. I loved it. I ate baseball, slept baseball. I would breathe baseball. I had my dad as my coach for a number of years. And on top of that, he would take me to batting cages and do private lessons and training sessions, and he would buy me special gear so I could get better, and I played all the time. And, and I got really, really good. I made some all-star teams. I have trophies that I earned, not that were given to me. Trophies that I earned. <laughs> Thank you. I had to clarify that. But I loved it. I absolutely loved it. And um, my plan was, I said, I'm going to play this. I'm going to go pro. I'm going to play through high school. I'm going to go play in college. I'm going to get scholarships. I'm putting everything I have into this. I'm going to do it. And then God changed things. Now, when George Willis was my youth pastor, um, some of you may know Pastor George. He was the youth pastor here. He is now the lead pastor at Generations Church in Pleasant Hill. Um, when he was my youth pastor, we went to camp. And I went to camp every year, loved camp. I had an absolutely great experience at camp every single time I went. And one night we're at camp, and God gave me the biggest haymaker he could give me in my life at that moment. I'm sitting there, and we're, we're singing, and it was God just like, Dustin, wake up. And he, he totally came, convicted me for the sense that I had all this head knowledge, but I was not having much heart knowledge with God. I, I could answer all these things, but I wasn't necessarily living it out. Now, I wasn't going and doing horrible things, but I really wasn't living the life that God had for me. I was focused on what I wanted, and God told me that he had a total change for me, and it was there at camp one year that he put in my heart to be a pastor. I know, baseball, pastor. Like those are just very different career choices, but God had laid it on my heart. <clears throat> he told me that my head was, <laughs> I had it all here, but when I moved it here, he had something so much better, something so much better than I ever could have imagined, not even close to sports. Now, for me, that was very inconvenient. I mean, it was like, I've spent years doing this. You want me to not do that and do this? And long story short, God was like, yeah, yeah, I do. I want you to do this instead. And looking back at it now, no regrets for what God has done in my life, choosing to do this instead of baseball. And I know people say, like, you know, oh, yeah, I was good. I'd have gone pro. I don't know about their story, but I was good, and I'd have gone pro. Right? I was, I had this thing down. But God totally had a different thing in mind for me. And I love that I'm doing what I know he set me on the path to do. <clears throat> I wasn't going to camp looking for answers, but God met me there. He knew where I needed to be for him to meet me and to totally rock my world. I was open to hearing from him. I wasn't pushing him away. And man, it changed everything in an amazing way for me. And wouldn't it be nice if you could have your life in order when you encounter God? Right? If, if you could schedule it, or if you could say, oh God, what do you want me to do in my life? And God says this. You're like, I'm already doing that. Perfect. Not often does that happen. I, I don't think anyone's ever told me that's happened to them, but often it's, you know, God has his plan, and when he reveals it to you, it's something different, but man, it is so full of joy. It is so amazing when you totally give yourself to the plan he has, and you see when God says, God, you met me here, and now you're showing me how I'm going to go there, and it's not my plan taking me there, it's your plan. Proverbs 3, 5, and 6 says, trust in the Lord God with all your heart, and lean not on your own understanding. In all your ways acknowledge him, and he will make your path straight. Now, I love this. Notice how it doesn't say, trust in God with all your heart and lean on your understanding um, and, uh, you know, follow him and you will make your path straight. No, it, that, that verse is all about trusting in him and letting him take your path, knowing that when he takes from here to there, it may not be where you want, you were thinking of going, it may not be where you want to go. He did the same thing with Jonah. Jonah definitely did not want to go, but God took him there and God did amazing things through it. And I love it. When God meets these people, and the stories that we read today, when God met them, he never told them to stay here. He met them here. Wherever their here was, he met them, but then they got to move. It was never about meeting God and staying where you are. It was always about moving forward with him. It's always an opportunity to grow. I hope that makes sense. The woman at the well, she defined, he defined where her here was. He got her to say it. This, you're right, you know these things about me. And then through the revelation, she went to tell people in Samaria about the Jesus she had just met. The people on the road to Emmaus, they defined where their here was with Jesus. And when he met them there, they learned that they needed to go there, back to Jerusalem, to spread the word of his resurrection. Peter took the opportunity to run and go back to here on his boat, but God met him in his here. And Peter learned he needed to go 
there. And Peter went on to do amazing things in the church, being the rock of the church. It always starts with defining your here. And that's going to be different for every one of us. Everyone's going to have a different, God, where am I right here? But when we, when we, t- we ask God, say, God, meet me here, he'll meet you here. And you'll get to go there. And it's an amazing thing. And secondly, I, I love that I learned in this that God doesn't find us unusable, but we can choose to be unuseful at times. Again, God doesn't find us unusable, but we can choose to be unuseful. Jesus never told Peter he was a failure. Now, Peter did some things in Scripture where you go, man, this, this, this guy just can't, doesn't get it. Keeps doing things over and over. But God, Jesus never told him once that he was a failure and he couldn't use him. But Peter did that to himself. You see, he decided that after he had walked away from, from God and Jesus and denied him three times, he went back to the boat because he was dealing with his failure. He was saying, you know what? Jesus, you can't use me. I need to go back to what I was doing before because I messed it up and I couldn't follow. God never says that to us. We say that to ourselves. And that's where we find him at this point. He's letting his failure define him and keep him from doing what God has called him to do. And, and I love this redemption story with him because it shows that, man, no matter how we mess up, no matter your past, no matter where you've come from, God can use you. God will use you. And the only thing that keeps that from happening is when we choose not to let him use ourselves. Our past and our failures do not define us. 2 Corinthians 5.17 says this, Therefore, if anyone is in Christ, he is a new creation. The old things have passed away, and look, new things have come. We have the ability as humans to totally dwell on our past and totally live in regret. And I I shared this first service. I had a dog that um, didn't live with much regret in her life. If she did something wrong and she got in trouble for it, she'd do it again. And she'd do it again. Um, at one point, she ran into the door, and we're like, all right, well, you, you're going to learn from that, right? Nope. Bam, ran into the door again. You know, so some, some animals don't often live with much regret, but people, we live with regret. We have the ability to pull ourselves back to say, oh, I can't do that because look at what I've done, or I, I'm disqualified because of this. Truth is, hard, honest truth, if we were, if our past defined our ability to serve God in our futures or in our present, There'd be no church. There'd be nobody here doing worship, nobody here teaching, except for my wife, Stephanie. She'd be perfect, ready to do whatever she wants. Or Pastor Terry, him too. But, you know, but our past, if that was a qualifier or a disqualifier, we'd all be disqualified. But God says, you know what, I can meet you in your failures, and we can work through that, and I can do amazing things because of it to take you somewhere that you never thought you were going to go. Peter got to realize his failures don't define him. Who he is in Christ, that defines him. His love for Jesus and Jesus' love for him, that is his identity. And Peter's able to realize that he was only unusable because he thought he was, and Jesus said otherwise. Never, ever think that God cannot use you. God can and will use you when you let him. The choice we have is to let him use us or choose to do our own thing. I guarantee you that when we choose to do God's thing instead of our own thing, there is so much more joy choosing God's way than could ever possibly happen if you choose your own. And lastly, we all have a story. The story of Peter in the boat and the following a conversation of feed my people, feed my sheep, um, feed my sheep. This is one that has been given as an encouragement message to Christians and Christ followers for thousands of years. But through those 2,000 years, it's great when you look at this passage. At the end of John, this passage is almost an afterthought. It's at the very end of his book. He writes all about Jesus and the miracles. And and if you read through the book of John, he he writes some, the way he writes about Jesus is like the man was just floating as he walked. He writes these incredible stories about how Jesus is the Messiah. And then he throws in at the very end this story about their conversation. But it is right where it needs to be because it helps us understand where he was and how Jesus still returned to him after everything <clears throat> that had happened in his life. The woman at the well, she didn't go back into town ashamed of what had haunt, haunted her for years. When she met Jesus, she had a total life change. Her story, Jesus didn't say, your story is a reason you're hiding and you will never talk to people. No, she got to use her story as a catalyst to talk to everyone else. She got to say, this is what I was doing. He knew it all. And look where he's saying to me now. Wow. Jesus will use your story. Everyone has a story. Don't ever think your story is too embarrassing. 
So don't ever think your story is too bad. So don't ever think your story is too lame. I used to think my story was way too lame. They're like, Dustin, tell us about how you became a Christian. The joke was I was born over there in this room somewhere because I lived here my whole life. Um, my parents grew up in a Christian home, came to church. Grandpa was a pastor. Dad's a youth pastor. Now I'm a pastor. Never did anything really wrong. Never went through any dark places. I love Jesus. My story in a nutshell. And I used to think that was lame. I did. People would say, who wants to share their testimony? I was like, no, let, let this person share because, man, they were struggling with, with addiction and, and horrible things, and God brought them out. Look what they're doing now. Let them share their story. That's an awesome story. I would never want to share mine. And then one day, I was told I had to. It's like, okay. So it was actually on the Mexico trip when I was in high school. I was sharing my story. And talked about how, you know, my life going through and I didn't have any real dark times in my life. Someone came up to me after service and said that my story touched them in a way no other testimony ever had. And I was like, why? <laughs> my story? And he said, I have two kids. And your story shows me that if I follow God, there's hope for my kids to not go through some things I did. They can just follow God and be all right. And for me, I was like, thank you, God, for using my story. Never think, however your story falls in line, that it's too bad, too lame, too hurtful, too long, or too boring. God will use your story. God will use your story to help someone else identify where their here is. Your story can help someone realize, oh man, I was right there, that's me now. And then they can have that moment where God says, and here I am too. Now we get to go here, we get to go there together. So my question for us is, this week, do we know where you, do you know where you are? Do we know where we are? Where, where is God going to find us? Where is our here? Has God found you? My prayer for all of us is that we can go and just have a moment with God where we say, God, here I am. Here I am, God. Where do you want me to go? Where do you want to take me? Because God's not just going to send you. He's going to be there with you the whole time. He will be with you when you go on your there. As you start 2020, when you set your goals and you say, God, we're going to go there, where is he going to take you? Are you like the woman at the well? Maybe you've never experienced the peace of God that only he can really offer. Maybe you're like the disciples on the path where you've been coming to a, a church, maybe Creekside, maybe another church, and, and you have a whole lot of head knowledge, but, but you're, having, you're struggling with giving God your heart. Maybe that's where you are right now. Or maybe you're like Peter. Maybe you feel like, you know what? I, I come to church, but I can't serve because I'm not qualified. My past keeps me away. My failures are too big. I cannot do it. And you're... you're you don't think you're good enough to be used by him. Or maybe you're like Matthew. Maybe you're living for yourself and not for God. You pulled yourself away just to survive. And you say, you know what? I'm going to do this for me, not for God. I guarantee you, no matter where you are, God will meet you there. He'll meet you there, and you can do amazing things with him. My challenge for us is to identify the here. Bring Jesus to your here moment. Know that he's able to take your here and get you to go where he wants you to go. Let's let 2020 be the year that we say as a church, God took me there. Amen? Would you stand with me? Pray with me as we uh, conclude this morning. God, you are so good. And I'm, I am so glad that our failures don't define who we are, God, but that you define who we are. The love you have for us, the grace you have for us, the mercy you have is the ultimate definition for our lives, God. We get to give it to you, and you get to say, I love you, and I will take you there. I pray for all of us, God, that we're able to, to identify our here. We're able to say, this is where I am, God. Where do you want me to go? And that it, is, it starts an incredible journey through you and with you of what you're going to do with us this year, God. I pray we give this year to you. We give our lives to you, and we start 2020 by saying, God, let's go there. Let's go there individually. Let's go there as a people. Let's go there as a church, God. But we're going where you are taking us today, God, because you will get us from here to there every single time. We thank you, God. We love you. And everybody said, amen.